Hey, if you are a typical American hunter, you've probably dreamed of going to Alaska or maybe Africa. Yeah, those are grand dreams to have, and they're even grander when you actually realize them. Well, today on RSO Podcasts, we have a guest who has done those countries and probably every one, uh, every one of the others on the continent. This is probably the most widely traveled and experienced hunter um, on the planet. And it's certainly the most experienced writer hunter. He has been writing about hunting guns and ammo and whatnot for pretty much all of his life, probably a few more years than even I have. And I think most of you will recognize the name, Craig Boddington. Craig has been all around the world, and he has more experience than probably 50 others <laughs> that I know. <laughs> so it's going to be a real treat to pick his brain and just hear some of his adventure stories, and get some advice from him about how we can increase our travels and our enjoyment of the outdoor world. Craig Boddington, welcome, partner. How are you? Hey, thanks, Ron. Listen, it's good to see you. It's good to be with you. How's things going in Idaho? <laughs> good to be seen. How things are things are going up in Idaho? Up. Yeah, we've got sunshine. Oh, good. Green Excellent. grass. Very good. Are, are, you in the, are you in the USA today, or are you off I, I am. I was I was at the Kansas farm till last night, and I'm back in the central coast of California this morning and talking to you. Well, great. Hey, I've got some questions for you. I told folks that you've been widely traveled, and I've been following your exploits since the 70s. Craig and I almost worked together at Peterson's Hunting Magazine. He uh, invited me to join him there, but I was afraid of the big city. I just couldn't handle it. So I stayed back in the country and did my freelancing thing. But we've crossed paths many a time. Uh, Craig, how many countries have you hunted in? Um, I think 57. 57. Now, how many species have you gone hunting for? Just big game. Oh, my goodness. Uh, something north of 300, Ron. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Oh, I know you've gotten the Weatherby Award. Why uh, that Weatherby Award is given for what exactly? What are? Oh, it's uh, the Weatherby Hunting and Conservation Award. It's it's kind of a a lifetime achievement thing that's that's given once a year, and it's it's based on uh, uh, international round the world hunting and and then uh, uh, conservation contributions and so on. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it, it's only given once a year, so those of us that have it that are still alive or kind of a small group. Yeah, I imagine. So obviously you didn't start off hunting the world. You grew up, what, a Kansas farm boy or what? No, no, I was, I was sort of a almost city boy. Uh, we lived on the western edge of Kansas City, Kansas. Dad was a, a bird hunter and an avid horse guy. And, and so I, I grew up with it. Dad was, was not a big game hunter, but understand in Kansas, when I grew up, we didn't have any deer. So good yeah. Kansas hunters were all bird hunters. The, the whitetails came later. Uh, for some reason, I was just fascinated by it when I was a kid. And uh, in 1956, when I was very, very little, uh, my uncle went, to, went on safari in Tanganyika, now Tanzania. And uh, I was four years old. And I just remember saying so clearly, by golly, I'm going to do that someday. Yeah. Yeah, that's great to have that kind of inspiration. So when did you actually get started in big game hunting? Well, Dad and I, Dad and I started in Wyoming with uh, mule deer and pronghorn in the 60s. And then we had deer seasons in Kansas after that. So we hunted in, uh, oh, we hunted in Wyoming, we hunted in Colorado, and we hunted uh, in, uh, in Missouri and, and adjacent states. And uh, uh, we went to Canada a couple of times in the 70s when I was still in school. So, you know, dad was interested, but he, he didn't have the passion for it that, that I did. Mm -hmm. So you got out, well, you went into the military. You were a Marine, correct? Yeah, I went to University of Kansas on a Navy scholarship. So as soon as I graduated, I, I went off to the Marines and uh, uh, came back uh, in, in the late 70s and, and went off active duty for the first time. Uh huh. What? When did you get started with the writing? I think I sold my first story in 1972. Uh, now, Ron, wow. you may be one of these guys that drives me nuts who say that you sold the first story you ever submitted and never looked back. That may or may not be true, but I guarantee you it wasn't true with me. When I was in school, I was trying, but I built up a boxcar 
full of rejection notices before I finally sold my first story. But I, I think my first one was 50 years ago. Yeah. And I suspect you did it the way most of us did back then. You just wrote the story and send it in and hope they'd take a look, huh? A hundred percent, Ron. I had no idea what I was doing. I, I was I was lucky when I was stationed at Camp Pendleton. Uh, the old Gun World magazine was just north of there in San Juan Capistrano. And uh, uh, Jack Lewis kind of gave me a call one day and said, uh, you need to come to the office. He said, the writing's okay, but he said, I need to give you some pointers. And he did. Uh-huh. And so I, I uh, took an afternoon off and went up there and he showed me what they were really looking for. And, and uh, after that, things got a lot easier. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. I've known in my career, too, you get good editors who help you along like that. They see some sort of potential in you and they guide you a little bit and off you're rolling. And I think you've probably also gotten it from other writers. I certainly have. You make good friends in the industry and, and they'll help you out, give you some tips, direct you to different magazines, and you're off and running. Well, you know, nobody can do this in a vacuum. Uh, you really, you think you can, but but you can't. And uh, I, I was lucky Bob Peterson took a chance on me and I was really very young when I was the editor at Peterson's Hunting. And, and uh, as you mentioned, man, I tried real hard to hire you, but... Uh, you were off in South Dakota having fun, and you were way too smart to come to Los Angeles. And uh, I probably, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I probably yeah, overstayed so my sure. welcome there. Yeah, yeah, I don't think so. You did a great job while you were there, and I thought many a time when the checks were coming in slowly, if at all, that maybe I should have joined you there for some <laughs> steady employment. But <laughs> well, I wish I you had. But uh, well. you've done okay, and and I've done okay, and. Uh, you know, 40 years later, we're, we're still here. But, you know, uh, the point was when I was the editor at, at Hunting, I, I really tried to make a point to, to work with newer, younger writers. And some of them have panned out and some of them haven't. But uh, during, during that stint, gosh, I, I bought the first stories from a whole lot of guys that many of you have probably heard of, uh, including uh, uh, Jim Shockey, Finn Agard, and, and uh, quite a few others. And some of those guys have done pretty well. Yeah, you got that right. Say, Craig, you know, everybody always asks of anyone who's hunted around the world, especially in Africa, have you ever been in a really dangerous situation, a charge, maybe an elephant wrapped his trunk around you and threw you into a tree or something? Got to ask you that because you've been there so many <laughs> times. <laughs> have you ever been tread on the edge? Uh, I've, I've been on the edge, but I've never been tread on. Uh, no, I've never uh-huh. been touched and never been touched. Uh, and honestly, I've never been physically present when anybody was hurt. Uh, it's not common. It doesn't happen all that time. You know, have there been some close calls? Sure. And there's been a lot more, golly gee, that could have gone a whole lot differently. But but yeah. uh, for me, it never has. And, and I, I don't think that's uncommon. A, a lot of really great African professional hunters go their entire career and never get hurt and never have a, a, a hunter injured. And, and of course, that's the goal. Uh, other guys are yeah. less lucky because these things are a little bit random. Yeah, they sure are. You know, I've never even been charged by anything. I've had a few bears come snooping around, but I wouldn't call it an aggressive charge. Have you ever had to stop an animal from coming? Yes. Uh, uh, lion, leopard, uh, Elephant buffalo. Wow. Which was the scariest? Oh, the, uh, the leopard for sure, 100%. The leopard was, was the scariest. That was a, I, I should have I been eaten that day, but, but a, a great pH with a big gun stopped the thing right at my feet. I, I, was, uh, I was using a shotgun. Uh, in those days, we really thought buckshot was the standard prescription for stopping a leopard. And, and uh, so I went in my leopard, I wounded the leopard. It was my fault. So I went in first with the shotgun and uh, uh, the thing came out right under my feet. And I, I remember uh, I hit him twice with buckshot and could see the charge hit. And I, I had just enough time to think the gun's empty and this is really going to hurt. And uh, then yeah. Russ Broom was off to my right with a double 500 and, and he made a brilliant shot. Thank goodness. Oh, I guess. 
I mean, that is one fast cat. The videos I've seen of leopard charges, you can hardly see the leopard are so quick. Well, and, and what you, you don't know until it happens and, and you don't want it to happen is they're noisy. Uh, when a leopard comes, really? he's, he's roaring all the way in and it's actually louder than a lion. Uh, it'll, it I'll will totally make you wet your pants. Wow. Oh. What about uh, elephants? They've always scared me. Just the, the times that I've seen them looking for me, they put that trunk up to pick up your scent and it'll just look like some extraterrestrial ET or something trying to pick up you. <laughs> and pretty scary when you think of an animal that big who's actively searching for you. Well, they, they will. And, and I mean, the real danger with elephant hunting is, is not the elephant you're looking for, but it's, it's elephants that are nearby that you haven't seen because it, it's amazing. And you've been there, how little brush it takes to hide a, an elephant. Uh, you, you, you know the one you're after, but there may be others around. And, and then if you get into a cow herd, that's, that's when things are dangerous. And, and with elephants, uh, you're going to spend a lot of time evading aggressive cows and usually you can get out of out of their way i've I, i've actually never been in a situation where we had to shoot an elephant that we didn't want to shoot but it's uh, uh, and especially in areas where there's been some poaching uh they get very mm -hmm. very paranoid they're very dangerous you just you stay as far away from cow herds as you possibly can yeah so have you had to stop any elephants the way you did a leopard uh, j just a couple of times. Yeah. But that's... Yeah, we've always managed to outrun them. <laughs> well, that's that's what you want to do is outrun them, stay, unless it's the elephant <laughs> you want. And if you're trying to get a shot and trying to get a shot and trying to get a shot and he eventually has has enough of the game of tag and, and, and comes for you, then that's your shot. Yeah, right on. And then uh, I think we probably have to touch on hippo. They always say hippo have killed more people in Africa every year than all the others. Um, and they're getting pretty aggressive. I've had a couple of false charges from them at least. And at least we had a, enough speed in the canoe one time and a boat another time to get away from that charge. But, boy, I've heard that they're, they're doing quite a bit of damage. Have you had any incidents with hippo? I, I, I actually have. Hippos are, are ill-tempered beasts. They're very, very aggressive and they're... They're very big. Uh, one time we were in a, a dugout canoe and, and we weren't hunting hippo. We, we pulled into a, uh, it kind of down a channel and there was a pool and there was a hippo at the far end and saw the head go under and uh, uh, Ronnie McFarlane was in the prow. Uh, Jack Atchison Jr. was with me and we were in the middle of the canoe. There was absolutely nothing we could do, but Ronnie had enough sense to put down his pole and and pick up his rifle and uh, about, oh, I don't know, uh, four lifetimes, a hundred seconds later, uh, we saw the uh, the reeds on the right-hand edge moving and, and they were moving, as they were moving, they were coming towards us like there was a torpedo headed our way. And uh, wow. the, the hippo surfaced right next to the canoe, nothing but uh, white teeth and a great big pink mouth. It was... Uh, Really, that was that was probably the scariest thing I've ever seen. But he didn't chomp the canoe, obviously. Uh, no, Ronnie Ronnie shot him uh, at point blank from the hip. Oh my goodness! Yeah, that's some pretty wild adventures. What about North America? Grizzly bears, brown bears, anything like that? Never, never. Yeah. No, I, I've never had a problem that's with good. a bear. Yeah, I haven't either. Knock on wood. <laughs> Hope yes, exactly. Up. Well, listen, for all the all the hunting you've done, you've obviously done a lot of conservation work. Too many people think hunters are have nothing to do with conservation when of course you and I know it's just the opposite. We're probably more interested in the game we hunt and their their welfare than anyone else. Um, can you give us some uh information on what you have seen conservation achieve over your lifetime? You mentioned earlier well, at the start that there were no deer in Kansas when you were a kid, <laughs> and obviously now they're covered up with whitetail, and I think there's a similar story with a lot of species, and I'm sure you know that story. Well, there is. We, we've done a great job here in North America, and of course, that most of that started uh, even before your lifetime, Ron, because I think you're a couple months older than I am, as I, if I remember right. Uh, <laughs> so that goes back a long ways, but most of the work in North America was started by Theodore Roosevelt at the turn of the last century. And, and we really, we've done a, a wonderful job, but 
Uh, elsewhere in the world, in some areas, there's still a lot of work needed, but in other areas, there's, there's, there's been progress. Uh, uh, Mexico is making tremendous strides right now. They're way behind us. They were, but they're, they're catching up fast. They're doing some wonderful work down there. I, I mean, in, in our lifetime, we've seen the desert sheep come from badly, badly threatened in the Sonoran Desert to today. They're just doing a wonderful job more permits than ever. That's suddenly become the most available of the, the North American wild sheep with more permits and readily available simply because they built up a, a lot of sheep. So that's a good example. Uh, Africa's tough because Africa's problem is loss of habitat. Uh, the, the burgeoning human population uh, is tough on wildlife. And, and so wild Africa has shrunk tremendously, but, but I've seen some great examples of some wonderful work that's been done. Uh, uh, you and I have both hunted in coastal Mozambique, and uh, it, they've just done a, a fantastic job. I hunted in Mozambique in uh, about 1989, just as the Civil War was winding down. And at that time, there was very little left. Uh, the wildlife had been used to feed both sides during a, a long and bitter Civil War. And and in 1990, I, I wrote that Mozambique was finished and could never come back. And fortunately, I was just completely dead wrong. Uh, given a chance, wildlife is more resilient. Now, a lot of areas in Mozambique are still recovering and some will never recover. But uh, in that area that, where we've hunted uh, uh, the Miramea, around the Miramea Reserve in coastal Mozambique, they have brought wildlife from literally nothing to just tremendous plenty. Uh, after the Civil War ended, the outfitters started to move in in about 1990, and they started protecting the game and hiring the locals and putting value on the game. And uh, uh, when they, when our friends went in there, they had uh, maybe 40 sable left, and today there's 4,000. Uh, there was a remnant population of buffalo in the deepest swamps, uh, maybe down to 1,000, possibly 1,200. And the the aerial count last year was uh, was over thirty thousand. They, they've done a wonderful job. So you know, given given protection and uh, in a third world economy by placing value on wildlife, there is hope. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. It just works so well. I just call it sustainable use. If you if you look at wildlife as a natural resource that can be used as it should be. I mean, that's how the world works. Everything feeds on everything else, and you maintain that system. People confuse market hunting and or poaching with sport hunting. They hate the word sport hunting, and I always say the word is not used to mean a frivolous pursuit for fun and games. What it references are the, the limitations we place on ourselves. Like any sport, football, baseball, tennis, you've got rules, you have boundaries, and you play within those rules and boundaries. And then you limit the harvest so that you have the sustainable population. And as you've seen and just told us about in Africa, it's worked remarkably well. And that's, of course, the North American model of wildlife conservation that's worked so well over here. Absolutely. Uh, you know, and, and the North American model is a, is a wonderful example. Uh, but I'm not going to say that our model can possibly work everywhere because third world economies are a a little bit different. Uh, here in North America, mm -hmm. we're so fortunate because we have relatively free access to millions and millions and millions of acres of, uh, of public land. And so uh, our wildlife is sustained by a, a very large hunting public that buys licenses and pays fees. Uh, and in other parts of the world, uh, there's usually going to be a much smaller public, hunting public. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, Namibia, I've hunted quite a bit, and South Africa have done a remarkably effective job, even though the wildlife is not considered a public resource the way it is here on private property. So the landowner, the farmer, owns the wildlife, and if, generally a farm means that you get rid of the native wildlife, especially the bison, the larger ungulates and stuff like that, uh, and then you grow livestock. And they figured out over in those two countries, at least, that if they displace the domestic livestock and bring back the native species, buffalo and hartebeest and wildebeest and kudu and oryx and all the rest of them, they're able to sell that meat the same as they would their livestock 
but they can also double dip by charging hunters to come over there and have a little adventure and do the harvesting for them. And then they can still use the meat, sell the meat, sell the hides, whatever they need to do. And that has resulted in an incredible increase in the native game populations in those two countries. Oh, have it absolutely has, true? Ron. No, they, they've done a wonderful job in both of those countries. I mean, they're all really a shining example. Uh, uh, in South Africa, uh, wildlife has increased maybe 20 times since 1980. And, and uh, the landowners have discovered, too, that because you have such a variety in Africa, uh, the land is better suited to wildlife than it is to cattle because cattle will only eat right. the grass and the goats goats will eat everything. But you have the, the antelope of different sizes where the giraffe eats on top and the tiny antelope eat on the bottom and, and uh, yep. the, the, land, the land will sustain more wildlife than is possible uh, with livestock. And, and in Namibia, the yep. same. When I first hunted in yeah. Namibia, there was very little going on. And now Namibia has the second largest uh, wildlife and, and outfitting and hunting industry on the continent. Yeah. And, and simultaneously, they were getting an increase in the populations of all that native wildlife, including the once endangered mountain zebra. It's crazy. It's just so effective and so simple. I don't understand why more people don't don't appreciate that, but then that's getting into politics and we'll kind of yeah. stay away from that on this show. Let's have a little more fun and talk about for folks interested in going to Africa, what kind of <laughs> rifles do they need to use? Do they have to get a double barrel 500 of some kind? What can you get away with over there? Well, you know, we try to make this too complicated, Ron. I mean, the, but the difference with Africa is, you know, when, when we're hunting in North America, now we're going elk hunting and maybe we maybe we have a, a favorite elk rifle or maybe we just take our a little bit larger deer rifle, but we're usually going for one animal. And in Africa, you don't really know what you're going to run into on a given day. Uh, any any area over there will have 10 or a dozen, in some rare cases, even 20 different types of antelope. And, you know, you have a plan in mind when you leave camp in the morning, but you don't really know what you're going to run into. So. When, when you think about African rifles and cartridges, the first thing you got to think is, is versatility. And usually, we, if, if you're going to also include dangerous game, then you're probably going to be hunting an animal that's a little bigger than anything you're used to. But usually, you want to think about two rifles, uh, uh, a very, very versatile utility infielder that you're going to use for almost everything, and then a little bigger gun that, that you're going to use for the very largest antelope and yeah, maybe a buffalo or, or possibly a hippo or something like that. So uh, the, the light rifle, the planes game rifle, and of course today, a lot of safaris are just planes game only because, hey, that's inexpensive and it's the best bang for your buck in the whole world. Uh, you know, what, whatever your favorite deer rifle is, uh, I'm strong on the 30-06 for Africa, but if you prefer a seven millimeter Remington or a or a 300 Winchester Magnum, that's, that's fine too. It, it doesn't have to be a cannon. Uh, it's probably not wise to take something like a 243 because it's just too limited on the size of animals you can handle with it. But just a really versatile deer rifle from 277 millimeter, uh, even a, a really good 6.5 is going to handle most of the African antelope. And then for the bigger stuff, you know, if you have a big gun or you want to take a big gun, by all means, do so, but you're really pretty hard pressed to beat the good old 375. And it really doesn't matter whether it's a 375 H&H or the more modern 375 Ruger. Uh, heck, they're all good, but a 375 really will handle just about everything. Now, if, if you're going to go into the rarefied air of hunting elephant, now that's getting specialized and you probably really do need a genuine big bore for that. But you know, people don't do that on their first hunt to Africa, not not these days. So the biggest thing you're likely to hunt is is probably a buffalo, perhaps a hippo, and a 375 will do you just fine. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's good advice. Now, what about bullets? That's always the the one where people get in trouble if you use the wrong bullet. You got any good <laughs> suggestions there? Well, you know, they're all good. Uh and boy, if you want to get into fist fight, you can you can start a campfire argument about bullets because we all have our favorites, and, and uh, uh, I've certainly got mine. Uh, you know, bullets perform differently. What what you 
have to have for Africa is you have to have a bullet that uh, is a, at least medium to, to heavy for caliber so that you'll get good penetration. And then you want a bullet that's designed and, and will provide penetration on the largest game you're going to hunt with that rifle, wh- whatever it is. Uh, I Again, 30 out 6 is one of my favorites. And you know what? Any good 180 grain soft point will handle all the Plains game in Africa. Now, some of us prefer the homogenous alloy bullet bullets like the, the Barnes X or the GMX and so on and so forth. Great bullets, and they're going to penetrate very, very deeply. Others, others of us still prefer the good old cup and core bullets, but as long as it's, it's at least medium for the caliber you're using uh, and, and designed as a hunting bullet, I, I certainly wouldn't shoot a, a target bullet or a match bullet uh, in Africa. Uh, on the bigger stuff, when I started, uh, soft points were still widely distrusted. Uh, people didn't believe in them, and and for buffalo and and everything bigger, it was solids only, non-expanding solids only, because they were going to penetrate. But there's not so much immediate effect. They they don't leave as large a wound channel. Uh, bullets have been improved so much in our time, Ron. My my goodness, I mean, in 375 uh, for for buffalo, I don't even take solids anymore. I I load good soft points. Some of us prefer the bonded core. Uh, some of us, again, prefer the homogenous alloy. Uh, they're all going to work. Now, when you get into the bigger stuff, uh, hippo and the very little rhino that's hunting that's done today, and, and of course, elephant, now it's non-expanding solids only. You, you have to have the penetration. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's great advice, Craig. Um, any issues with, with the smaller? Well, I, I think there's so many folks over here now that want to do long range shooting with really speedy cartridges, I don't see any advantages for Africa hunting. I, I do understand, and I've been there, there are some really wide open desert like habitats in which you can shoot a long way. But it just seems to me there are enough opportunities, as there's so much game over there that to really get the, the meat of the hunt and experience it, a guy can do some stalking and get plenty close enough so that you really don't have to depend on extreme range shooting to get your game. Does that make sense? Well, it, it does. And, and most, most African professional hunters simply won't allow it. Uh, they have seen so much bad shooting from guys like me and guys like you that they're terrified of long range shooting and they will get you as close <laughs> as they possibly can. Now, you know, there is open ground where you're not going to get real, real close, but Extreme range shooting is usually not necessary over there and, and generally not allowed. And, and you have to understand African rules, too, because over there, uh, uh, if, if the trackers find a single drop of blood, that's, that's your license and that's your animal. And if there's a trophy fee, you're going to pay that trophy fee and there may not be another animal on quota available. So, you know, it makes you careful. Yeah, yeah good points, man. Good points. So now let's talk timing. A lot of young folks, eh, middle-aged folks as well, I guess anybody who's never been to Africa but always dreamed of it, go now or wait for a better time. You know, there's COVID issues, there's strife around the world. When is the best time to go on an African hunt? Well, none of us were going much of anywhere during COVID. That, that, was, uh, <laughs> that was an unusual situation. Uh, but I, you know, Africa changes quickly. Uh, you don't really know what the politics are, are going to do in a, in a, in a given country. And, and Africa is a, it's a changeable place. Uh, I, I wouldn't go so far as say it's an unstable place because that depends on the country. But, uh, you know, go now. Uh, you know, if, if you can go now, go now. And if you need to plan a couple years out, yeah, that's fine too. A plan a couple of years out, but I would, I would go whenever you can, and let's hope we don't have another pandemic. Yeah, especially while you're over there. <laughs> well, you know, a mistake that I made, Craig, early in life is that I put it off a little bit further than I should have. I didn't get started until the mid '90s, just thinking that foreign country it would be too expensive, uh, all the usual reasons or excuses that we have. And I regret that because once I went and, and realized how easy it was to get there and how much incredible hunting there was in the wildlife that we see and all the reasons you fall in love with Africa, 
I think you've said it more than once. You go once, you're not, you're not going to quit. You're going to no. have a, a fever to go again pretty quickly. So I always urge people to go as soon as they can. Uh, too many guys have put it off until they reach a point where, gosh, I was in a car accident and I broke my leg and I can't walk very well now, or something happened to me that prevented me from going, or the country shut down, and we've seen that happen. Um, I don't know if you ever got into Kenya before it shut down, but gosh, that was the destination in Africa for so long. And now look, their wildlife is almost gone. They haven't had any legalized hunting there for I don't know how many decades. 76, was it, when they shut down? Well, I hunted there in 77, and I was one of the last. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, it, I, I hunted in March 77 in Kenya, and it closed in, in May. And that was totally sudden, totally unexpected. Uh, it's not the only time that has happened. Uh, it, it can happen. It's rare. Uh, but you, you just don't know. Uh, the, you know, a great mentor to me was Jack Atchison Sr., a booking agent in, in Butte, Montana. And I've known that family since I was 15. And Jack's mantra was, go hunting while you're physically able. And that's really yeah. good advice. I, I know, you know, you and I are not getting any younger. And, and we all know people who really wanted to go and waited to where it just wasn't practical anymore. And, and that's sad. Yeah. Because it is doable, uh, yeah. And and the other the the other thing is uh, trip insurance. Uh, you know, Africa is a changeable place. So you know, you're you're planning a hunt now that may not take place two years down, two years from now. Uh, uh, just just get good trip insurance and make sure it's good stuff. Uh, but talk to your travel agent about it, and uh, it's not really terribly expensive and you can insure that deposit so that, now again, this is rare stuff, but if there's a pandemic or a country closes or if a civil war breaks out, uh, get, get really good all-risk trip insurance coverage so that, so that uh, you know, when it's over, you can plan again. Yeah. No, excellent point. So do you see a good future for Africa with that burgeoning human population? taking habitat from wildlife. I'm a little bit down on the potential for the future there. I mean, I've seen how it can work and they've got excellent potential for increasing game numbers as they've done in Namibia and South Africa and Mozambique. But I've seen the flip side as well. What's your long-term forecast? What do you see? Well, G Ron, I mean, I'm not a gloom and doom guy, but, but the long-term forecast is not good. Uh, it, it isn't simply because uh, the, the human population continues to grow. Wild Africa is shrinking. Uh, it's also third world. They're poverty stricken people. They're, they're going to eat. They have to eat. They're going to poach. <laughs> and uh, it's long term, it, it's a problem. And, and I see wild Africa shrinking. Uh, but that's long term. Uh, there's going to be great African hunting long after you and I are gone. And I think there's going to be great African hunting for our kids and, and, uh, and perhaps for our grandkids, but, but it's not going to be as open as it is today. It's not going to be as varied. Now, right now, there are more countries in Africa open to hunting than there were when I started in the 70s, uh, mm -hmm. simply because there are more African governments have learned that sustainable use works placing value on wildlife works. And there's uh, more than 20 uh, sovereign countries in Africa that, that are hunting countries today. Now, that's not a big percentage. There's about 55 uh, countries in Africa. And certainly, they're not all hunting countries. But there's more options to hunt Africa right now th than there was 20 years ago and 30 years ago. So at, at the moment, uh, the picture is, is pretty bright. But Wild Africa does continue to shrink. Yeah. Good. So what are some other alternatives? New Zealand, Australia, New Caledonia, Argentina. I don't think there's any hunting in Brazil, but there are other places in the world that folks might want to explore. What is it like over there? Well, New Zealand is a, is a beautiful, beautiful country. Now, they have been very, very shut down through COVID, probably the most shut down country in the entire world. And those outfitters are suffering. Uh, they're they're suffering. They're they're in trouble because 
They've gone two complete seasons with absolutely no business. Uh, but they will come back, uh, starting to open now slowly. One of the last and the slowest to open. Uh, there's some great hunting in Australia. Uh, New Zealand is a gorgeous country. Uh, South America is way behind us in, in wildlife conservation. And uh, uh, a lot of their native game uh, is in terrible trouble. In fact, the majority of South America's native game is is on the is is threatened or 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 endangered, but there is some wonderful hunting uh, in Argentina, and Argentina is hunting in in South America. There are a few other spots, but Argentina is a a fantastic country. Uh, a lot of it is for introduced species, uh, some of the best red stag hunting in the world, and 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 a whole lot more. And of course, the bird hunting in Argentina is the big business. Uh, Argentina is actually the largest hunting destination in the world for visiting visiting sportsmen. Uh, more than twenty thousand a year, which which exceeds even South Africa or Namibia combined. Wow, I didn't know that, Craig. That's probably because of the doves and the ducks. It is. It, it's fantastic bird shooting, but there's also again great red stag and axis deer and. And uh, the list goes on. There, there's uh, more than a dozen species you can hunt in, in Argentina, and it's a, a beautiful country. Yeah. And there's wonderful well, listen, opportunity. For, for Americans who are interested in that sort of thing, especially the conservation end of it, what can we do to aid worldwide conservation? I think we all understand over here, if we're hunters, we're contributing through our excise taxes we pay on our firearms for the licenses we buy, we support our fish and game agencies. But how do we help things out in these other countries? What can we do to aid conservation work in the other countries where we might want to hunt? Well, you can go hunting and that helps. Uh, uh, but not everybody really wants to travel. And I, I understand that. But it's really, really important that, that we support uh, the conservation organizations that are working so hard ar around the world, uh, Safari Club International, Dallas Safari Club, and and there's so many more. But but that's probably that's probably the one thing we can do. And and you know if you take the the 12 million or 14 million uh, American hunters, and then you look at the number of of those hunters that actually support the organizations that are supporting our sport and keeping it alive. Uh, their membership numbers are are ridiculously small. Uh, so, not saying you need to be a joiner and join them all, but but you really need to support the conservation groups that are trying to keep hunting alive, uh, not only around the world but also in this country, because we've certainly got our own fights with the anti hunters. Boy, you've got that right. Yeah, it's a an ongoing battle. We cannot rest on our laurels. I think we you would agree that we can thank our forefathers from Teddy Roosevelt on down for the wonderful work that they started and made incredible progress through the 20th century. Uh, you can remember when whitetail started coming back in Kansas. I can remember it in South Dakota. And I think you and I and anyone in our generation have enjoyed the probably the finest hunting opportunities on the planet as far as diversity and, and the ability to get around the world and take advantage of these things. We had jet travel. We had cured a lot of diseases. We weren't too afraid of picking something up from another country. We could get inoculated. Travel was fairly comfortable. We had excellent outfitters to help us out when we got there. I think we were darn lucky, Craig. Well, yeah, we've lived in a good time. Yeah. Let's hope we can keep that for our kids and grandkids, as you mentioned earlier. I hope so. I hope so. Yeah. You got any big plans coming up? No, I've I've been kind of busy the last the last couple of months, uh, and uh, I don't have a lot going on. I'm going to South Africa in uh, in June, and uh, got a black bear hunt in Canada coming up in April. But right now, Ron, it's turkey season, and that's important. Mm. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you got a few turkeys over there where you're living, huh? Are you guiding for turkey in uh, on no. your place in Kansas? No. I don't have enough. Well, no, no that's not true, Ron. I don't have enough turkeys and I am the world's worst turkey hunter, but I love it. No, we, we, uh, we hunt our whitetails pretty aggressively, but, but we don't, we don't do any guided hunts for turkeys. Ah, what about California? You've got turkeys out there. We do. California is a great success story because California was not historic turkey range. We didn't, the, not a single one in the golden state historically. And, 
they started introducing them about 40 years ago. And, and we've got turkeys all over the place uh, within, 10, within 10 minutes of my house. Oh, nice. Yeah. Similar story here in Idaho. I, have, uh, I saw my first turkey on our ranch this winter. My daughter looked out the window and said, hey, Dad, there's a turkey. I said, no, we don't have any turkeys. Uh, sure looks like a turkey to me. By golly, it was a turkey. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Well, listen, Craig, you and I could talk all day, as we often do in camp when we're hunting, uh, but I think we probably have to give folks a break. Would you be willing to come back and visit with us some other time? Sure, anytime, Ron. Yeah, it's, it's good yeah. to be with you. You and I haven't spent near enough time together the last few years. We've been busy, but we need to fix that. Yeah, we'll have to put something together. And I'll look forward to it, Craig. I want to Me thank too, you for Craig. joining us, folks. If you want to find more out about Craig, you're gonna you've probably read his articles in any number of magazines. He's just works everywhere. And he has been on many, many television shows. Are you doing any TV right now, Craig? I'm not I'm not doing much. I, I'm really not doing much. A lot of it was totally shut down during the pandemic and and uh uh, you know, Ron, you know better than I do. The best way to ruin a good hunt is take a TV camera. And uh, <laughs> you so got I'm really right. focusing on the writing and uh, uh, some other things we got going. And I, I'm, I, I will do some TV, but I haven't done much since the pandemic and really haven't much resumed. Yeah. Now, are you, you're selling books and uh, have you DVDs now or is your stuff on YouTube? Where can folks find you? Uh, the easiest way is, is my website. Uh, and it's real complicated. Uh, www.craigboddington.com. And uh, that's, a, that's a primary outlet for our books. And yeah, we've still got some of the old DVDs on there and, and uh, a little of this and that, but that's the easiest way to find me. Yeah, well, great. I encourage everyone to do that because Craig, talk about knowing your stuff. You know, this man has been at it since the 1960s as a hunter in the 70s, early 70s, as a writer, he's been everywhere. He knows everyone in the industry. He's had his chances to sample not just hunting around the world, but all the equipment that goes along with it. And he's got excellent advice. He's a pragmatic individual. He served our country well as a Marine. For Are you still in the Marines? Oh, heavens no. I retired in 2005. Yeah. 2005. That's, uh, okay, yeah. They'll, well. yeah they'll, they'll come and get Donna and my kids before they come and get me again. <laughs> well, thanks for all that, all the years of service you gave us, Craig, uh, not just in, in the writing, but in the Marines. Um, and we're looking forward to a whole bunch more. So hang in there and we'll uh, look forward to seeing you down the road and uh, we'll toast one over a campfire somewhere in Africa. How's that sound? Sounds good, my friend. Good hunting. All right. Thanks for joining us. Hey, everyone. This is Ron Spomer inviting you to listen to RSO podcasts every time. And if you get a chance, go to Ron Spomer Outdoors on youtube that's our channel where we handle guns and ammo and hunting and shooting and ballistics and all the more details and we sure enjoy visiting with craig and you until next time this is ron spomer hunt honest and shoot straight